the host today too, right? And this is your regular day too? No, I am on Saturday, Guru Maharaj. Today, Lavanya Mataji is not there, so I'm just serving oh, okay. today. So, so you're, okay, you're filling in. All right. Um, so we're doing this series on Lord Chaitanya's pastime to Shankasi, and we're at verse number 200, chapter 17 of Adi Lila. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tats My Shri Guruvena Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stafitam Yena Bhutta Lens Vayam Yuka Kedam Mayam Padati Swam Padanti Kam Sama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste, Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pucharine, Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pasyatya Deva Satarine, Panchakopa Tarubis Jakriva Sindhu Pavija, Patitanam Pavane Vyo, Vaishnava Vyo, Namaha Namaha, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Pavulitananda, Svidvaita Gadadhar, Sivasati Gaur, Bhakta Rinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Verse number So we'll continue now in the discussion between the Chankazi and Lord Chaitanya is taking different angles. The Chankazi admits that, you know, what he's saying is not actually authoritative and Lord Chaitanya has defeated him, showing the fallacy of his arguments based on the idea that cow killing is allowed in the Shastras. It's not allowed in the Shastras. <clears throat> Lord Chaitanya defeated him on that level. And now he admits that he was attacked or visited, when that's a better word, visited by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Nishringa Bhagavan, who threatened him, not threatened him, but chastised him for his misbehavior and trying to destroy the Sankirtan movement and his breaking of the drum. The Lord was merciful. He was originally going to kill him, but he decided, I'll give you another chance as long as you don't mis misbehave again. <laughs> so now it comes to the point where <clears throat> the Kirtan was so loud and so tumultuous and so attractive that everybody's chanting, even people were chanting involuntarily because they were just so much swept away by the spiritual energy. And so this is where the discussion is. So we hear now that the Kasi is speaking and he's talking about how the Hindus vibrate Hari Hari and this is also being spoken by some of the followers. Yeah, this is actually being spoken by the followers or the constables of the Kazi who are explaining how they were affected. So now we're in the midst of that, and this person is speaking here. Say hoite jiva moru bala hari hari. Since that time, my tongue always, since that time, my tongue also always vibrates the sound. Hari, Hari. I have no desire to say it, but still my tongue says it. I do not know what to do, purport. Sometimes demoniac non-believers not understanding the potency of the holy name make fun of the Vaishnavas when they chant 
the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. This joking is also benefits, beneficial for such persons. In, in Srimad Bhagavatam, it indicates that the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, even jokingly in course of discussion, in indicating something extraneous or in negligence is called namabhas, which is chanting that is almost on the transcendental stage. And this is interesting. How someone who is not even regularly practicing chanting can come to the stage of namabhas so fastly simply by these categories of, of what we say, uh, incidental chanting jokingly in ordinary discussions, indicating something extraneous or in negligence. Mm -hmm. This Nama stage is better than Nama Parad. Nama Bas awakens the supreme remembrance of Lord Krishna, Lord Vishnu. When one remembers Lord Vishnu, he becomes free from material enjoyment. As he gradually comes forward towards the transcendental service of the Lord and becomes eligible to chant the holy name of the Lord in the transcendental position. So here, this, this is described elaborately by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in his book, um, Madhurya Kandambini where he talks about these stages of Nama Bas. It's also nicely explained by Srila Haridas Thakur, written by Bhakti Vinod Thakur in Harinam Chintamani. So there are three stages. We have heard many times. The stage of Nama Parad, the stage of Nama Bas, and the stage of <clears throat> Sudanan, or pure chanting. So this is the intermediate stage. <clears throat> it's better than Nama Parad because Nama Parad is the lowest and the stage that one wants to free themselves of so they can actually make progress in chanting. So we know the stage of Nama Parad is based on the 10 offenses to the holy name. And of course, the 11th offense in the tent of chanting is a is an offense that uh, causes one to commit the other offenses. Or maybe it's better said, the 11th offense uh, opens ones up to the possibility of committing the other offenses. In other words, when you're chanting attentively, then there's very little chance you'll commit other offenses. But if you're not, then the likelihood of the other offenses may appear. And so we know there are 10 offenses. The first offense is to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to the propagation of the holy name of the Lord. There are people who take up the, the preaching of the holy name as their life and soul to find fault with them, to criticize them, to vilify them, to this is considered the first, and what is it called? Hasti Aparad. <clears throat> Hasti refers to elephant, and if you, and your devotional life is considered to be like a garden, where the soil is your devotional service, the seed is given by the <clears throat> spiritual master at the time of initiation, the watering process is the chanting of the holy names. The removal of the weeds is our diligence to avoid the offenses like that. And if that's all there, the garden will start to grow and flourish. But then as your garden is growing, if you invite an elephant to come into your garden, then there's nothing left of your garden. So this is the first offense to the holy name. And we, we have to be very aware not to become critical of any Vaishnav, but especially those who are in the position of giving their lives to spreading the glories of the holy name. So that is a 
called Hasti Aparad, elephant offense, where once the elephant is in and out of your garden, there's not much left to your garden. So, and then when we practice devotional service, we wonder why there's no taste. Um, offenses cause us to lose the taste of bhakti. <laughs> It doesn't throw you outside of bhakti. In other words, you can still execute devotional service, but it makes bhakti somewhat tasteless until we uh, overcome the effects of that offense. Then the taste can return. And then that is done, of course, in two ways. And by engaging fully again in devotional service and by carefully chanting the holy names of the Lord and avoiding those up those offenses. The second offense is to consider names like Brahma or Shiva to be equal to or independent of Lord Vishnu. Uh, this Westerners, those who grew up in the Western countries, don't have too much understanding of this offense, nor are they aware of how it works. But those who are from the in India know that it, it's very fashionable in many areas to throw all of the different devas together into one group and consider it all the same. You know, you worship Shiva, I worship Brahma, he worships Krishna, he worships Vishnu, he worships Ganesh, she worships Durga. Yatamata, Tatapata, it's all the same. Worship is the important thing. The, uh, the focus of the worship is incidental, but because we're all worshiping, we're all doing the same thing, we're all getting the same benefit. No. So Brahma and Shiva are Angas, of Vishnu and they work under his control. Although, although Vishnu is the person who maintains the uh, material energy through his different energies, Brahma and Shiva are also connected with creation and destruction. So these three work together, but ultimately Vishnu is supreme and Brahma and Shiva are Angas or demigods working under that. And so sometimes, and it's not sometimes, it's quite very it's quite fashionable. And you, you spend time in India, you'll meet so many people who don't make a distinction on worship. And they think all worship is the same. <laughs> sometimes it becomes quite ludicrous where they even include their departed grandfather as one of the forms of worship. Oh, uh, yeah, so we, one has to be, understand that Vishnu is the source of Brahma and Shiva, and therefore he is distinct and superior. So to put them all on the same platform is the second offense. The third offense is to disobey or to minimize the instructions of the spiritual master. It's called Guru Avagya. Uh, disobeying the others of the spiritual master, even if one does not, does it, what we say, unconsciously, still it has its effect. It's important that the disciple become intelligent enough to know what is the instructions of the spiritual master, and then learn the process of how to follow them. And that's important. It's not like, oh, I didn't know this. No, it doesn't work. The spiritual master makes his instructions available either through his words or his writings or in some form, one must take enough time to learn them and follow them. And if we, if we don't, that is considered a very severe offense to disobey the instructions of the spiritual master. Or as the verse says, Arche Vishnu Siladi Gurushu Namati Vaishnava Jati Bhuti Consider the spiritual master to be an ordinary person, like, well, he grew up like I grew up, and he has this background and that, like that. People do that with Srila Prabhupada because he was a family member and he had a business 
he had children. So they they look at that and they say, well, you know, you know, he's just like me. Maybe he's a little more intelligent. No, that's when the spiritual master is uh, he's empowered by the Lord, and that's the that's the difference. He becomes empowered by the Lord's shakti to do the work of uplifting the fallen souls. So that shakti empowerment puts him above the ordinary persons. Okay, the, the fourth offense is to blaspheme the Vedic literatures or literatures in pursuance of the Vedic versions. So one should not find fault with other, other scriptures, although they may find they may be faulty in some sense. Every, every major religious scripture teaches some aspect of devotion to God, and that should be seen. Uh, the details are not so important, and there's one very long purport in the fourth canto where Srila Prabhupada very uh, concisely but very much uh, clearly explains that <clears throat> one should be one should not criticize others religion because what that does is that causes disturbance in one's mind and then it becomes somewhat offensive and of course even in the vedic literatures there's different levels of Shastras, we have the Puranas, we have the Itihastras, we have the Upanishads, we have the, yeah, the Dharma Shastras, we have the actual Vedas itself, we have so many categories of Vedic knowledge, and some are more devotional than others, but still one should not find fault and understand that for different classes of people, People are meant to plug into the Shastras on the level they can understand so they can gradually understand, apply, and then move forward to a higher level. So therefore, it has a purpose why there are different levels of teachings. It's like there are different levels of education for different people on different grades of, of practice. <laughs> The fifth offense is to consider the, the glories of the Lord uh, as imagination. Um, in other words, the scriptures give very strong verses and statements glorifying the holy name, saying that the holy name is, <clears throat> you know, once chanting the holy name, automatically one can be free from all sinful actions. Uh, committed for many lifetimes. We had that, this, there was that discussion, which turned into be a, an offense to Srila Haridas Thakur in the assembly of uh, Jagadish and uh, Haranya Majamadara, where he criticized this uh, Gopal Chakravarti, criticized uh, Haridas Thakur by saying that you're saying that simply by chanting the holy names, of the Lord, you can receive liberation. When we see the Shastras talk about how difficult it is to achieve liberation. So he became offensive and actually got the reaction for that offense. So there are those, and specifically here in this particular purport, Prabhupada explains what is non bas So you might think, wow, just by chanting negligently or extraneously or jokingly or ordinary one's on the trans one is almost approaching this transcendental platform this must be some eulogy some imagination some hyperbole or some exaggeration but no actually the scriptures don't exaggerate if the scriptures do um speak in such a way that they are not what we say exact what does it mean it means that it's a understatement the glories of the lord the holy name are understated not overstated <laughs> so one will think oh they're overstated therefore we think that they're imaginations so that's an offense 
to give the inter interpretation of the holy name of the Lord is the sixth offense, and that is where people uh, compare the chanting of the holy name as some other glorious activity in the mode of goodness that elevates one's consciousness, comparing it to, I don't know, like some kind of meditation or anything, any kind of comparison or using similarities to anything else will cause that to be what is called false and false interpretation. The, the holy name cannot be interpreted. It can only be experienced. So when we do explain the holy name, we say the holy name is Krishna fully in transcendental sound. And that is the correct understanding of the holy name. And any, any other type of interpretation would be considered to be an offense. The seventh offense is uh, an offense where people might take advantage of the, of the glories of the holy name, the mercy of the holy name by thinking, well, the holy name is so powerful that once when we chant, we can get relieved from the sinful activities we commit. And that is true, but if persons purposely commit sinful activities with the idea of getting relief by chanting, that is considered an offense. That is called namna yasya bala hi papabudhi. It is considered to be papabudhi, that it means the most dangerous and severe offense. To try to use the holy name in order to allow yourself to commit sinful activities. I'm going out and get intoxicated. I'll come back and I'll chant. And then I'll get the re get relief from the effects of breaking the principles. No, there was an incident in one, in the life of one devotee in our movement who introduced chanting, uh, smoking of marijuana along with chanting of the holy name. This uh, devotee was very charismatic and he had a following within our movement and he was a leader. And so in doing that, he got others to believe it. And then it started to circulate that we can chant Hare Krishna and smoke marijuana. <clears throat> so it came back to Srila Prabhupada what was happening. And of course, Prabhupada told it to stop it but the devotees question, well, you know, he's chanting the holy name. So isn't that to his benefit? Prabhupada said, actually, he's chanting with offense. And this is the offense that we're speaking of. That you can't do things that are against the glories of the, the, the practice of the holy name. And at the same time, get the benefit of the holy name. If it's done accidentally... That's one thing that can be excused, but if it's done purposely with intentions, then that is considered a dangerous offense. The eighth offense is where which people who grow up in India sometimes fall into and not clearly understand. That is to consider the chanting of the Hare, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra to be one of the auspicious ritualistic activities offered in the Vedas karma kanda. That means that, you know, you do your chanting, I do my homas, I do my worship, I do my puja. It's all the same. Chanting is puja, so therefore I'm, I'm doing puja in a different way, but it, because it's puja, it's the same. So they compare or equalize other spiritual activities with the chanting of the holy name and compare it to certain as sections of the Vedas and specifically as mentioned karma kanda karma kanda means looking for some material benefit from one's spiritual practice and there are rules and regulations for karma kandis that's a section of the Vedas that people can practice but it's not no nearer the, the glories of chanting of the holy names. So those who equalize all these other forms of worship and practice with the holy name, that's also an offense. 
The ninth offense is to uh, teach the glories of the holy name to the faithless. Sometimes in our preaching of Krishna conscious, we will meet people and we'll try to encourage them to chant. But if they become resistant and do not want to hear, then don't push it. And one should not try to convince them by telling them about the glories of the holy name because they might find fault with that or somehow or other criticize that. In other words, the idea is just keep it simple for those who you're preaching to. And as they make advancement, you can give them more and more. Um, sometimes we, what we say, inadvertently commit this offense when we give a lecture, when there are a group of people and there are people who are practitioners who have been practicing for a long time and then there's newcomers. So the newcomers, sometimes we preach to the practitioners and not so much to the newcomers and the newcomers may misunderstand and also become doubtful. So we have to be careful of that. Generally, when there's newcomers in a group, you try to keep it so they can understand along with the advanced practitioners. And the tenth offense is to consider the chanting of the holy names of the Lord um, uh, to remain, to, to become, what is it? This is the attachment, what is that tenth offense? To, uh, After hearing so many instructions on the holy names of the Lord, one is still engaged in materialistic activities. What that means is that this is the I and mine principle. I've been to so many lectures. I've been to practicing Krishna conscious for some time, but I'm still on the bodily platform thinking this is my body. These are my family members. This is mine. This is I. The, the I and my platform. Now, this tense offense we have to be very careful of because one has to develop at least theoretically the knowledge that I'm not this body and everything that is in connection with me is simply given to me by Krishna. It is his energy like that. And I have to interact and serve that energy according to the relationship I have with that energy whether it's an individual or something to be used in the service of the Lord. So this tense offense, devotees have to be very careful of because we find devotees fall into this one easily. <laughs> and so, and of course the 11th offense is to chant in a tent within, without attention. And then that is by distraction, by lackadaisical attitude or by chanting in a sleepy state where one falls asleep while chanting. So these are the three categories of inattention. So therefore one has to be very careful and work on, and this is where Bhakti Vinod Thakur emphasizes, here's where you make advancement, work on attentive chanting. And in Harinam Chintamani, there are practical activities you can perform that helps you overcome inattention. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur gives detailed explanations of these practical activities and how to execute them where you can uh, access uh, more of the energy of attention <clears throat> in your chanting. Okay, these are the 10 offenses. So these are, this is what this particular verse is talking about. So rather than going on to the next verse, we'll just stop here and see if there's any questions or comments in relationship to chanting, Namabha stage, or in relationship to the offenses. <laughs> I should add that <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada, uh, practically every time he gave formal initiation, 
at the ceremony, he would ask one of his disciples to recite the Ten Offenses as part of the program to remind people what they should avoid. Because Shastra talks about anukulena, things to do, and pratiku, things to avoid. And so things to avoid also fall into the category of importance. We have to learn to avoid certain things. Okay, so we'll stop there and see if there's any discussions. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Very important uh, topic today. Um, 10, actually 11 offenses. Um, uh, I have uh, some question, but maybe at the end. Devotees, uh, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and you can ask or use the chat. Hare Krishna. Dear Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. Thank you for reminding us about the importance of avoiding these offenses. I'm still uh, wondering about how if someone doesn't even know anything and they're jokingly or derisively or just accidentally saying Hare Krishna, how is it that that is straight on the Nama Bhas platform? I think you mentioned it in the lecture, but I still couldn't get it. Would you please explain a little further? <laughs> The explanations is in the statement itself, <laughs> in the sense that uh, <clears throat> they're not chanting with offense, they're chanting without offense. So that means because they don't know about the offenses and they're just chanting the holy name, therefore it is not offensive. Well, the thing is, you know, what are they going to do the next minute? They're going to go back to their materialist activities. And so they'll be back down again to the material platform. So it has the effect of Nama Bas, which pushes them forward. It's called a Gyata Sivriti. They get some benefit. But unless they actually take up the process, you know, they won't be able to, uh, you know, make any, any advancement. <clears throat> So these are incidental, it's called Agyata Sukriti, unknowingly getting the mercy. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada gives the example, which I mentioned, I think yesterday, or the day before, how this one Muslim being chased by a, a, a bull or a boar, I can't remember, boar or bull, he was yelling, Haram, Haram, Haram. Finally, he, he was killed. Haram in Arabic means abominable, but ha, H-A is the first half of hare and ram. So in one sense, the Lord was hearing hari ram. <laughs> and because it was done without offense and complete helplessness, he got, he got mukti. <laughs> But you have to see how this works for mercy. When one is conscious of, of the facts and the fences and the process, then one has to follow accordingly. These are special mercy for people who somehow or other come in contact with the holy name in a very incidental way. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think I understand a little better now. Your, your lack of understanding is the fact that you can't understand how, how merciful Krishna is. That's it. That is true, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> very merciful. Takes the essence. He takes the essence. Baba 
Baba Gunohi Janardana. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? <laughs> Today is also the appearance of Varaha Dev, the boar incarnation of the Lord who picked up the earth from the Garbhodaksai Vishnu and killed the demon Haranyaksha. And that's a very important day. So we actually fasted yesterday for this day. Um, and the Lord appears in different manifestations of himself and whatever form he appears in is completely and fully spiritual. Although he appears as a, uh, a pig, a hog, he's not. But he does that in order to perform the activities such as going down to the bottom of the ocean is considered to be a very unclean activity. The bottom of the ocean is considered to be very dirty as it, say, as it mentions in the Shastras. And so pigs go into dirty areas. So in order to facilitate his own transcendental pleasure and to perform the activity, he lifted the earth, which was disturbed by the demons, especially Hiranyaksha, who was taking unlimited amount of gold out of the earth, <clears throat> so much so that it destroyed the equilibrium of the earth in its orbit and it fell. Now you can imagine how big Varaha Dev was. In fact, when he appeared, he was only a small little tiny dwarf. <clears throat> he appeared from the nose of Lord Brahma. And then he continually grew in right in front of Lord Brahma and many of the devas. Practically he covered the whole sky. He was so huge. And then when he picked up the earth, he put it on his tusks. So you can imagine how big those tusks were because the earth, you know, is not a small item. <laughs> it's huge. And so, yeah, so this incarnation did the work. And then when he came out, the demon challenged him and then there was a fight. The Lord played with him as is explained, just like sometimes a mouse would be running and the cat will see the mouse and will chase after the mouse and then he'll corner the mouse and the mouse can't go. So he'll run the other way and the cat will go the other way. So the cat is just cornering the mouse in different ways. He's kind of playing with it. And finally, after some time, he just grabs the mouse and finishes him off. <clears throat> So in the same way that the Lord played with the demon, and this caused disturbance to the demigods as they were watching the fight. And because they were so eager, they were afraid of this de demon who had caused so much havoc that they wanted him killed soon, but the Lord wanted to enact his transcendental pastimes playing with the, with the demon for a while. And finally, in a very nonchalant and very we say almost uh, playful way. He hit him on the back of the head with his hand and just being hit by the Lord on the back of his head, the demon tumbled down and complete and fell. In fact, he was killed by the, the hitting of the Lord and then he fell out of the sky. So this is a really nice description of the battle between the demon and the Lord. It says in the Shastra that the Lord appeared in two, Swayambhuva, Manu, and in the Ro 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 Rochisa Maha Manvantara, two different Manu periods. One, he picked up the earth, and the other time he picked up the earth and killed the demon. 
like that. Let's mention. When the Lord got out of the water, he shook his body, and from his body, the hairs of his body fell onto the earth, and that later grew as kusa grass. And kusa grass, we know, is a type of grass that's used in worship, like that. So that kusa grass is, is, is considered to be sacred because it comes from the body of the Lord it grew in the form of this grass. If you've seen kusa grass, it's like razor sharp. It's really, it's like grass that's almost like, <laughs> like a knife. Uh, one has to be careful handling it. It comes in big, big sheets sometimes, or sometimes in smaller pieces, but it's a little cutting. <laughs> So that came from the body of the Lord when he shook himself and the hairs fell onto the earth. Like that. And the Lord impregnated the earth when he touched her, being his wife. He produced a child and that child was Naraka. Later he became Naraka Sora, Boma Sora. He actually, due to bad association, he became a demon, although he was born from the earth and from the Lord. Later on, due to bad association, he became a demon. So this is very instructive how important association is. Sadhu Sangha is the foundation by which we can make advancement in devotional service. To take the association of devotees and serve the devotees in that association. But he took association from the wrong people, demons, and therefore, uh, and he committed offenses to the Lord and to the Lord's devotees, and therefore, the Lord wound up killing him later on. And that was a great fight, as mentioned in the 10th canto, how the Lord killed Bombasur. Boma means earth. So he had two names, Narakasura and Bomasura. So the Lord is impartial. If someone surrenders to him, even if they're a demon, the Lord will give them protection. And if someone is their, his, his own personal son, if he goes against religious principles, then he gets the chastisement of the Lord. So the Lord is equal. As he says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yayatam Mam Prapadyante Tamsta Daiva Bhajami Aham Mama Vartmanu Vartante Manusha Partha Sarvasyaha. Everyone is following my path according to how they approach me. The direct path is the spiritual path, the indirect path is the material path. Both paths are enunciated by the Lord. <clears throat> So this is a little bit about Varaha Dev, who appeared today in Prabhupada. He gives some lectures, nice lectures about this incarnation. So if you have time today, uh, go to the festival category of Prabhupada's lectures and you'll find two lectures on Varaha Dev. Okay, so we're still good for questions. If anyone would like to ask questions either about the Holy Name or about today's festival day. Vivek Prabhu, do you have a question? Thank you, Mataji. Uh, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, my question is, uh, it's like difficult to understand from this material senses side. Like uh, heard that these Krishna pastimes and Leela are happening in different, different universe uh, simultaneously. And we are just like in only one universe. But like, 
Jay Vijay, like he got, like they got that uh, this curse that they have to take birth only three times. So, is this like these kind of things, and also Krishna past times that's happening again and again? Sorry, uh, which difficult to understand. I'm not sure my question is right, Guru Maharaj, but sometimes this kind of confusion comes, like what exactly that means. Leela are happening in different universe. Same yeah, Leela. the Lord performs his leelas in one universe, like he did here 5,000 years ago. And after he leaves, he goes to another universe and performs the same leelas, but the details of the leela will be, will be different. The leela is the same, but some of the details are different. And that's how it's explained. Prabhupada said, just like in some, right now it's almost according, it's UK time is like 1249, right? So, um, so in other words, somewhere in the world, it's 1249, always. <laughs> somewhere in the world, it's five o'clock, always. In other words, as you go over around the world, you can find that time period somewhere. So in the same way, the leelas go from universe to universe. So the leelas are the same, but the universes are different. Just like everywhere, everywhere at six o'clock somewhere. <laughs> I mean, somewhere at six o'clock, somewhere it's five o'clock, somewhere it's four o'clock. So all the times on the clock are there throughout the entire world somewhere. <laughs> Does that analogy help you? Mm-hmm. Yes, Guru Maharaj, uh, that helps. Uh, just like question comes like these kind of birth, like Krishna births happening again and again in different different universe, like those kind of pastimes also happens or it's just like... Uh, yeah, but not exactly as we experience it in this universe. The details yeah. are, are sometimes, sometimes they say slightly different or sometimes they say different. But the essence of the pastime is the same. It's called Nitya Leela. Yes, Guru Maharaj, thank you. I heard I actually have... like your one lecture on this, like Nitya Leela. I remember first time when I saw you in Manor, few years back, you gave one lecture only on Nitya Leela. So thank you, Guru Maharaj, thank you. Hare thank Krishna. you. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, I have a question on what you said. Uh, sometimes in preaching, I know that uh, some individuals or families, they also chant different types of mantras or concocted chalisas, you know, like they have the you know, different types of bhajans as well. But then I, I tell them that don't Rather than reducing something, I encourage them to include Maha Mantra in their chanting. And uh, many times I know that uh, they are uh, they don't have attraction or sometimes they even have some sort of envy towards Krishna consciousness. But I still encourage them to chant. So sh- should I do that or would that benefit or, 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 or that's a Nama Prad if I encourage them to chant? Knowing that they have some enmity or a different mentality. Well, if they're resistant to what you say, then you don't continue to continue to try to make it happen. If you see, if they're not resi- if they're doing bhajans, using your example as the understanding, then yeah, that's one way to get them to chant Hare Krishna. We do that when we go to yoga centers. Yoga centers, they when they do their kirtans. They do various mantras from different places. So we always bring in the Hare Krishna mantra and then they like that and then they chant and they benefited. 
but you can see if they if they say no no if they don't if they become resistant the problem is if they become resistant and you push it then you commit an offense for pushing it and they commit an offense because they're offensive to the holy name so it's not good for them either So just, you can introduce it when you see there's an opportunity, but you have to see if they're accepting it or not. <laughs> but you keep doing it as an example. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for the clarity. It's okay? Yes, Maharaj. Simple. Just don't force it. <laughs> Guru Maharaj, I have a question about the first offense uh, that you said, Hasti Aparad, um, which is being critical to other devotees. Um, so a um, lot of times this critical being critical happens when we are uh, meeting them often or you know familiarity too much familiarity um, I uh, remember uh, reading in uh, Madhya Leela Chaitanya Charitamrit uh, Madhavindra Puri's uh, quality um, he uh, they said that he was uh, he would keep to himself he would not mingle too much like he was he was, um, I, I wouldn't say quiet, but he wouldn't become too familiar with too many people. I don't remember that verse, but then is that how it, uh, it should be? Like if, if we find ourselves being critical to people, then. Well, when we are for the sake of preaching, it's a mode of compassion. So if you're, in a, if you're in the role of preaching, you have to meet various types of people. And rather than being critical, you have to be compassionate. Even if you see faults, it's not so important. But if you're on the, uh, you, you don't really try to create peer relationships with people like that because then um, there's expectations that come upon both the, from both sides, and then when those expectations are not fulfilled, we can find ourselves being critical. And so Madhavendra Puri, whatever he did associate with people was simply in relationship to his service to, uh, to Gopal. That's all. And he avoided, you know, people in general. Because he was on a higher platform, he was he's a, pretty much a, you know, like a Mahabhagavat. Mm -hmm. But for preaching, you can't avoid people. You just have to somehow or other uh, act as a doctor who is administering the medicine, or as a mother who is trying to, you know, cure the sick child. <laughs> who doesn't want to be cured. <laughs> mm. Hey, you just have to, if you find yourself becoming critical in the mind, just don't express it. If you express it, that's where the offense is. Get it out of the mind by, by being concerned about how you can help them. If that's your, if you're coming together with that, if you're coming together as a group to do like, like Nam Hat programs at your house, then, uh, you know, that's in the mood of preaching, that's in the mood of inspiring people. So you just stay focused on what you're doing. And you make friends with those you can talk to, who you can resonate with, who you can uh, find being comfortable with and the others you can always respect from a distance. Mm. We can't really be intimate with everybody. 
It's not possible. Hmm. Even Krishna, he, he chose who to become intimate with and who not to become intimate with. <laughs> he was intimate with Arjun, but he wasn't as intimate with you know, other Pandavas. <laughs> yes, yes, Gurudev. Yeah, it's something you have to work at. It's not something you can immediately understand. It's, you know, relationships are always so complex sometimes. But we want to avoid relationships that are, you know, materially uh, oriented. Or just wasting time. Mm -hmm. As we say, the devotee is friendly to everyone, but has only a few friends. <laughs> Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Does anyone else has any questions? Okay, we're right at the mark, two o'clock. Or one o'clock, your time. Depends where you are. Everybody's clock says something different. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll continue with this pastime. But tomorrow is Lord Nityananda's appearance day. So that'll be a topic of discussion tomorrow. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Guru Maharaj,